Exclusively on Secular Media Network, this is the Gaytheist Manifesto. Hello and welcome to the Atheist Manifesto, your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. I am your host, Callie Wright, joined most of the time, as most of the time, by my co-host, Ari <laughs> Coleman. I have a crush on Avery Bull. Oh my god, that's so good. And I'm oh, so it disappointed. Good. Like my voice like broke halfway through. I'm so <laughs> disappointed that there are so many people who aren't going to get the reference. Yeah, if like, you don't, then just get out sad. of my life. Yeah, homestarrunner.com, that's all I'm going to say. It's actually homestarrunner.net. It's .com. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Okay, so <laughs> this week we're going to have uh, a super cool, uh, important discussion. Uh, this week I want to ta- have a talk about how we choose to engage with people who disagree with us on basically anything obviously the context of the show is you know lgbt and atheist stuff so we'll talk about that um but uh but i i think those things kind of go across the spectrum of things that can be disagreed disagreed upon so um our guest is kyle jones he is the founder of interview an atheist at church day kyle welcome to the show hi how's it going good good so um tell me a little bit about interview an atheist at church day uh you know where the idea came from how you executed how that whole thing works sure so basically i'm an ex-christian i was uh a christian for about seven years there i was a youth pastor involved in ministry and i went off to grad school and as has been known to happen started deconstructing a lot of my beliefs and challenging them and then the next thing you know over The course of about a year or two, I deconverted and became an atheist. And I had these two eras of my life, right? Like this Christian Kyle with all of his friends in ministry and all all of that. And then I had this new identity, a new community of non-believers. And I wanted to try to find a way to bridge the gap, not just the communication problems, but to try to find constructive ways for atheists and Christians to work together. And a way that I thought uh, that would handle that uh, well would be having an interview, setting up an atheist with a pastor, where during the service, the pastor would interview and ask personal questions towards an atheist and kind of put put flesh and blood to the idea of an atheist and humanizing atheists and humanizing pastors. So it was a sense in which I wanted a constructive approach as opposed to the mudslinging and the, well, you're an idiot. Well, you're an idiot. (laughs) You know, you believe in fairy tales and you believe in social Darwinism. And right. I I just kind of got sick of that debate format. And so it launched a couple years ago. And the first year there were about 30 across the United States that happened on one particular Sunday. And then ever since that, it's just kind of grown where now it happens whenever um, I can arrange it. And uh, we've had, I don't know, 50 plus interviews. And um, yeah, it's been an enjoyable process, uh, but difficult at the same time. Yeah. So I'm imagining the first one of those was probably you reached out to, uh, you know, to a pastor and had one of these conversations yourself. Is that accurate? No, no. I started by just facilitating and coordinating it. I had tons of friends that were pastors uh, from both. All of my degrees are in theology. So uh, I have lots of friends in in the ministry. And as an atheist, I was still friends with them. And I said, oh, well, you know, I know this new atheist guy um, and I know this pastor and they're they live in the same area. So it basically was a kind of Christian atheist matchmaker for for a while. And uh, a bunch of those happened. And then I started, I joined in and started um, doing my own with certain pastors that I knew. But I initially just facilitated it. 
Gotcha. So, so I mean, talk me through the first one. The first one of these that you did. It's got to be kind of an interesting thing. Like, do you jump into the like super conservative, um, you know, churches and like, like, cool, we're gonna mix it up and you know try and keep it civil, or do you try to go more towards like the liberal leaning churches, or how does that how does that work out? Yeah. Well, I initially didn't really have a plan for it, but as it naturally played out, the churches are normally mainline kind of non-denominational churches or Lutheran or Presbyterian. And then, you know, they're sort of in the middle and too liberal. I, I don't really target the Southern Baptist churches or the Reformed Presbyterians or the hate-mongering uh, <laughs> William Lane Craig types because, first of all, they're not going to be uh, they're not going to want to humanize an atheist. They're not going to want to hear about their life experiences and uh, where they've come from and give them that benefit of the doubt. They're going to want to debate them. They're going to want to um, show that they're right and the atheist is wrong and all of that. And I don't want to, I didn't want it to divulge into that. So I didn't really go out targeting really conservative Christians, but some of them have been what we would generally consider conservative Christians. Um, but just with a more open mind towards dialogue and having discussions with people they disagree with. So I've had a vetting process. So I've had to vet not only the pastors and the churches, um, but I've also had to vet the atheists because I didn't want to um, set up a really, really firebrand atheist who is going to go into a church and tell everybody that they're delusional and have a God virus in their brain and that. (laughs) So I, (laughs) I've had to do it on both sides. Um, but that vetting process on the pastor side, it's been, um, it's generally not taken a lot of force, right? It's kind of naturally happened that they're mainline to progressive. So the first time you did one of these, how did it go? Well, it went really well because, I already knew um, a few of them. So I did this kind of U.S. tour thing where I went to five or six different churches across the U.S. and spoke there. And I had already known a few of them, right? I'd already met them. I sat down and had a drink with them or um, we had known each other through other interfaith endeavors. So there was already a certain uh, foundation that was laid. And, um, And then they all just, they all went really well. I mean, there were times in which uh, a certain question came that would strike me as, you know, somewhat condescending or, you know, one of the big ones, obviously, that atheists are asked in this environment are, where do they get morality from? Right. And sometimes when people ask that, it can be like, how are you not out there raping and killing people, which is kind of <laughs> condescending. Right. You or, know, like, or are you secretly doing so? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you're putting on your your Sunday suit here and acting like a good, friendly atheist when really you're in a basement, you know, torturing kittens. I don't know, but <laughs> it. Yeah, it was, sometimes when that question is asked, it can come across as somewhat condescending. Well, well, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> where do I get morality from? And I always respond. My my favorite way to respond to that is, well, if you didn't believe in God, where would you get morality from? Right. Like and they'll usually end up saying, well, just from my experience and from my reason and from my sentiments. And I go, exactly. Well, that's that's basically what I do. Other times it's not asked in a condescending way. Sometimes it's asked in a a genuine way, like philosophically, how do you justify, you know, condemning something morally or praising something as virtuous? And in that sense, I can understand people are just generally interested in like where naturalists or materialists philosophically derive their ethics. And that, that to me is, is fine. Um, so I've, I've been asked a couple questions that have uh, been interesting. One in particular might relate to this podcast too is, is that was going to be right? my next question. I'm glad you're about to say this. <laughs> yeah. Like as a Christian, uh, you know, am I an atheist now? Because as a Christian, did I have issues like sexual problems? <laughs> you know, like obviously I had, you know, was it sexual sin that drove me away from Christianity, you know, and um, or or just also questions about 
um, you know, how I view LGBTQ persons. But sometimes those They're could be worst. kind of oh, awkward. So gross. <laughs> it's like when you ask, it's like, um, oh, God, I remember I was at the secular student conference um, and I met uh, uh, Heine boy. Yes. And I love Hina. Was, Friend of the show, she, Hina. Yeah, she was talking about uh, – she's awesome. She was talking about how she gets asked the most ridiculous things as like an ex-Muslim woman. Like, you know, have you had FTM done to you? And, oh. <laughs> you know, so I feel like sometimes Christians will ask me they'll, – they'll assume like there was some nefarious sexual issues that must have occurred um, to make me an atheist. Um and I do think there is a sense in which that's partially the the strictures, the um, the black and white psychological splitting in guilt that comes across with a certain view of sexuality in Christianity that can cause people to uh, change their views or abandon Christianity or their theology. And for me, that's a good thing, right? That's a maturing process. Um, but yeah, so the, sometimes you get asked funny questions. Well, <laughs> I'm glad that's I'm glad that's the worst it's gotten. Um, well, at least in your experience, I'm sure you know across you know lots of other conversations. I'm sure some people have been asked some pretty ridiculous things. Um, so I think at, at the root of this, and, and the root of why I wanted to have this conversation. So for you, in your mind, what is the root of this? sort of thing being so important to do like why why have these these kinds of conversations yeah it's i always when i get asked that i always feel like a kind of a bit cliche and hallmark but really honestly it's because we have to find ways to live together um you know we may have different social groups and um, environments that we find ourselves in that are not the same, that are very different, but we share this earth, right? We, um, we vote in the same elections. We, uh, there's all these things that we share and all the way down to our basic humanity, which we share. So I feel like, uh, there has to be some way to forge what I call strange connections, right? Like strange alliances that you wouldn't think would exist but can actually exist and a lot of that has to do with a certain type of pragmatism right like there are atheists that i know that look down upon what i do as if somehow i'm um condoning or approving you're an um, enabler um yeah exactly <laughs> i'm i'm enabling the idea that churches are okay and pastors are okay and thus what all horrible churches and what all horrible pastors do, I think is okay, which is absolutely false. Right. But, um, it does take a certain, I don't know how to say it other than tact, right? Like you pick and choose your battles and you navigate this gray area um, when you don't feel like you need to be principled ideologically, you try to navigate this area. I mean, we talk about this a lot as atheists, right? Where we're having a Thanksgiving meal or a Christmas or something and prayer comes up or someone sneezes, you know, do I feel weird saying bless you? Or, or if someone says bless you to me, do I say like, shut the fuck up? Like, don't tell, me, <laughs> don't tell me bless you. I always joke when someone says bless you to me, I'm like, you can't bless me. You're not a Catholic priest. Like I only <laughs> take blessings from Catholic priests. But, uh, you know, we try to navigate these gray areas. Life is not simple. Life is complicated. And there are uh, multiple layers of gray. And I think it's okay to swim in those seas. And I think it's good to try to find um, strange connections and forge unique um, alliances and, and build friendships too. So that's a long-winded way of saying we got to find some way to work together, I think.
I've struggled with confidence throughout my life, and I've struggled with shame and internalized transphobia and internalized racism and internalized classism. And so I've, I have all that stuff, but there was something, something in me believed I had something special. Telling the truth to myself about myself is awesome because it's just a relief because I don't have to like try to be something I'm not. I can just be. Who you are authentically is all right. The shame is what kills you. Believing that you are unworthy of love and belonging, that who you are authentically is a sin or is wrong is deadly. Who you are is beautiful and amazing. It's important with all of the messages that might tell you otherwise that you have that um, in yourself to say that I am beautiful, I'm smart, and I'm amazing. Before we jump back into the show, it's time to thank our patrons. This week, we're recognizing Revan Reborn. Thank you so much for believing in us enough to contribute to us financially and for being a part of this movement. Patrons of the Gatheist Manifesto have access to cool stuff like a big shout out on the show, premium content, including an audio journal I've decided to keep documenting the more personal stuff I don't dive into on the show, and an exclusive patrons only hang out once a month. If you're so inclined, head over to patreon.com slash the Gatheist Manifesto to become a part of this movement and support the show. Thank you. The thing that I struggle with, and I guess this kind of, I mean, this is kind of our segue into the conversation about, about how we actually, you know, do these kinds of things. My problem sometimes is where, you know, where do you draw the line, right? So, obviously, I have lots of super liberal Christian friends who are 100% on board with LGBT equality, 100% on board with Black Lives Matter, 100% on board, uh, on board with, you know, basically any social justice issue you can think of. Um, so, like... Yeah. Those people, like, as far as I'm concerned, we don't disagree on anything important. You know what I mean? Like, like I'll have the religious conversation with anybody who wants to have it with me. But, like, I mean, if, if we can agree that, like, loving people and letting people, you know, love who they want and be who they want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. Like, if we can agree on those basic things, I don't really care much about what, what else you believe uh, in a lot of ways. But, you know, and, and that's obviously, like, the far the far you know in, inside of the spectrum and then there's the far outside of the spectrum like obviously people like Westboro Baptist Church and you know all yeah. the people who are you know the extremists so you know my thing is where you know where do you draw the line because we know um, there's a lot of science surrounding the idea that you know, the peer pressure and social pressure is a really is, is actually a really effective way to change people's thinking right so on one hand I do see the argument of like, we have to be willing to openly criticize religious beliefs or woo or pseudoscience or whatever. And, you know, we can't, you know, we can't feel like we have to sugarcoat some of those things in a lot of ways. But we also know that attacking someone is also a really great way to strengthen cognitive bias, right? Mm -hmm. So, so my, my thing is, so first of all, like navigating that. And second of all, navigating like where I'm going to engage the conversation because, in a lot of ways, there is something to be said for the fact that if I'm going to engage in this conversation, on some level, I'm validating your point of view, right? Like it, it's like the idea that, um, like the idea that Bill Nye shouldn't have debated Ken Ham because now Ken Ham has a platform and he's seen as you know having a, a an equally legitimate or a, you know a point of view that's equally worth worthy of respect and consideration, even though it's 100 percent not. Right. So we have to deal with the practical reality that there are people out here who think this way and people whose minds aren't going to be changed. So, like you said, we got to figure out something, you know, how to how to live with each other and 100 percent with that. So, you know, where do we draw the line to affect change and where do we draw the line and say, look, like. If you're really that against my basic humanity or my right to be equal to you, like I'm not going to sit down and smile and shake your hand. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like, how do you how do you navigate that space? I guess, like, do, I mean, do you have 
like certain like hard boundaries that you won't cross or like how how does that factor in for you yeah that to to be blunt that is really the question the ultimate it's not the ultimate question like Hitchhiker's <laughs> Guide, but it's it, it's second. It's second to the ultimate question because it's how do you get along with someone or talk with someone you fundamentally disagree with, like at the atomic level. <laughs> You're like the fibers of your beings are at war with each other. Like this is the ultimate question, and it it's very tricky. Of course, I don't have any. Uh, clear answers. I think if anybody were to answer that question with like a two sentence spiel, it would be disingenuous. Like there, the whole point, like what I was saying earlier about how complicated life is, is that these lines are not clear. They're not, the lines are not clearly delineated. I mean, the only thing I can really do myself is follow my conscience. And of course, I'm not going to shake hands with Fred Phelps or if he was still around like and say you know or Jerry Falwell and say like good job I'm I like what you do I it would be hard to hold in my vitriol and my general just unease with their existence but <laughs> right. the your existence time, makes me uneasy ex- ex- exactly it's <laughs> your existence bugs me like the <laughs> fact that you are here it, i'm bothered by but at the same time if somebody were to um and this is this gets a little tricky and muddled here if somebody if, if some atheist for instance this is a stupid um could be a false hypothetical scenario, but forget it. Atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Christian. Uh, If somebody were to attack one of them, right? Like they're just spewing their vitriolic nonsense and somebody were to start pouncing on him and cracking their skull, I would defend them. I would, I would say like, there's a different way to go about this. And this does come back to what you were saying earlier about hardening cognitive bias. You attack somebody who already has a martyrdom complex. It's not going to help your cause, right? It's going to affirm. It's going to provide validation and proof for what they're saying all along. Um, Look at how persecuted I am. Look at, right. This is all part of some epic plan of gods or whatever. So it's, it is tricky, right? Yes, you do not want to harden their cognitive bias, but you want to follow your conscience and also stick to your principles. And to do so is tumultuous. It's for me this whole process of being an atheist who does interfaith is it's a difficult thing. It's not I live with a lot of unease because it's not it's not easy. Um and I, of course, I do not have clearly delineated boundaries um, for this process because life isn't mathematical. It's not mechanical. Um, and just on a, on a last note here is there is something about the content to what you say, right? Like me telling somebody flat out, I think that that view is false. I think that it's hazardous. It's problematic. It's false and it's demeaning. Um, and the content there is true, but I can convey that content in different ways, like the method, the manner, the way that I say something means a lot too, right? Like I come across uh, confrontational and in somebody's face, people put their guards up, right? And and it breaks down the ability to really dive into some of the nuances that we have. So I think there's a strategy. There's a strategic way to communicate with uh, people you disagree with. A lot of that has to do with your, your tone, your body language, your um, humor. Like when I, and I do have conservative Christian friends, there's a sense in which I can use humor to lighten the air to try to create some little space that some thoughts might get in there and, you know, start, uh, swirling around in their brain. I don't know, but there, there's a tact, there's an issue of tactfulness. And, yeah. um, well, in, yeah, so, so here's, here's what I struggle with, you know? So 
I my my natural tendency is um well at least lately I used to be the kind of person who I like I would immediately just go on the attack and like f you you're wrong you're stupid this is idiotic and here's why like I've definitely lately tried to like step back from that a lot more and try and at least like I'm not afraid to tell people I think they're wrong but at least like try and understand where they're coming from and why they think the way they do and you know you can still convey like well you're wrong and here's why but at the same time I think back to like and maybe it's different for me because I wasn't raised in like a brainwashing like Christian situation like mm-hmm. I went to, I went to church with my grandma and I was uh, like I guess a pretty lukewarm Christian like as a teenager and the first time I really heard like open disagreement with Christianity was this kid that I went to school with just trashing it like people who believe this are idiots this is the stupidest thing ever it's all fake it's fairy tales and all this kind of stuff and like I have to admit that that's kind of part of what what pushed me to turn around because I thought to myself like wow like I know this guy he's a good guy he's really smart and mm-hmm. you know he's saying all of these things and I'm like maybe I need to look into this a little deeper you know and I mean it was that along with a lot of other things so th- there's part of me that like I can't entirely dismiss the firebrand approach You know what I mean? And it's, you know, different approaches in different situations kind of thing, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I can totally understand that. And I think that, of course, it's not a one size fits all, um, the uh, issue we're discussing here, right? Like you were saying context and situating it, it's different. You know, when I, uh, the way I approach some firebrand preacher on the corner is going to be different than the way I approach my old, sweet, conservative grandmother. (laughs) You know, it's just going going to be a different approach there. But there is absolutely a space and a role and positive contributions for people like David Silverman, who I, in my view, has a lot of things wrong with his approach. But... Am I going to say that everybody has to follow my, you know, jovial, lighthearted, interfaith atheist thing? No, like that's that's just me. And it's okay that somebody else is not doing what I do. And this is it. This is fundamentally what I would want to touch on is being all right with people not being like you. That, I think, is one of the hardest things for all of us to come to grips with the fact that not everybody is going to think the way I think the fact that people might never ever be like me and to be okay with that is very difficult because it's a natural inclination to want others to think like you that right that's just kind of normal we're social animals and we want our groups and we also hate being wrong we want to be right it gives us a sense of purpose a sense of dignity a sense of um confidence to be sure of ourselves and we want other people to validate that um but i remember thinking a while ago what what there's lots of atheists out there who have this um i would say utopic view of secularism right with the advent of the intelligent, autonomous uh, person, religion will dwindle and atheism will will rise and eventually the world will be full of rational atheist thinkers and it'll be peaceful and all of this, um, which I reject that view. I reject that yeah. assumption. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, my, and what, what I did was think about the opposite. What if my navigating assumption, what if my initial assumption is that religion is never going to go away, that Christianity is never going to fade away, that that conservative fire and brimstone hate monger is never going to go away? What do I do with myself in the meantime? Like, so Cry in the a, corner. Yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's sad. To be honest with you, there is a sense in which it's tragic. It's tragic that 
um, it may be the case that there's always going to be horrible asshole people like that. That sucks. But um, my question is, if we just assume from the get go that religion is not going anywhere, that Christianity is not going anywhere, what do we do in light of that? What do we do in spite of that? And that it, it's difficult, right? It, it comes down to a kind of pragmatic way of acting in the world that doesn't assume that um, these things are just going to go away one day. Yeah, I, I definitely think there's something to be said for that. I just, I, I feel like I'm always, and I mean, this is like you said, it's tumultuous, you know, like I feel like I'm always kind of fighting a battle inside myself because the the way that I end up seeing conversations a lot of times is so like, you know, I, I'm pretty active in my local trans community and I see people, I, I am not one of these people, but I see people who are in the worst of worst positions. You know, they're on the edge of homelessness, on the edge of starvation. They can't find a job. They can't find health care, all of this kind of stuff. Right. And these people already think that no one cares about them. Right. And the people who are in a position to do something about it, are the people who are people of privilege, you know, people who are rich or, you know, don't have those kinds of day to day worries, you know? So on the one hand, the people who are in those awful positions, they need to see someone fighting for them and fighting for them hard. Right. Because it, you know, it's, it's like a morale thing, but yes. on a practical level, if I want to get anything done, I can't just come at those people like uh you know, like a, like a Mack truck, like, like, look, asshole, you're going to listen to what I'm going to have to say. Like, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's a really tough line to walk sometimes. And, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> absolutely. It, like, absolutely. And that, and I also, exactly when it, I felt that way, I felt something inside of me when I just spoke, like the other side of my, my thoughts going, you know, there is a time for anger. Yes, there, is a there time absolutely for, is. <laughs> there is a time for outrage. There, not everything is zen. All right, like the world is moved up, and there need, needs to be people who stand out and, you know, call bullshit and call a spade a spade. And those people are absolutely essential and vital. Um, and especially when we're talking about people. Like who you're talking about, right? The the desolate, the downtrodden, the uh, for, sorry, I'm a former youth pastor, so of course I say <laughs> I'll do it. That. Uh, <laughs> the absolutely the homeless trans kids, right? The the druggy, the person who has fallen through the cracks of contemporary society, who cannot find any solace, who has been abandoned by their family, who has been um, just destroyed inside and out and there does need to be someone championing these people who advocate for them who fight for them who scream for them because sometimes privilege is death and you know you need a megaphone to shake people um so when i talk about all this pragmatism and this gray area and this there's also a side of me that's like well sometimes that you need to scream and um and so i totally applaud people who do that who who stick up for the marginalized and the oppressed um but and once again it's situational as much as i would love to say it you should be one way or the other it's i can't right i would be i would be doing a disservice to myself if i said you should always act in this gray, pragmatic way, or you should always act in this principled black and white way. It's it's both. And that's really another crappy facet of existence is that there aren't, ans there aren't easy answers to these questions. And when somebody provides these easy answers, I instantly am skeptical of them. Like – Yeah. <laughs> right? All the, all the manuals out there on how people should live their lives – it's like I'm done with the manuals. I don't need another book or instruction on how I should behave because life is just too complicated for that. Yeah, you know, and I think 
one idea that I'd really, really love to get a, to to just completely get rid of is the idea that being pragmatic means that you aren't principled. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, cause I, <laughs> my new thing arguing on Facebook nowadays is the whole, um, you know, burning or bust mentality. Like if Bernie <laughs> yeah, doesn't win, the, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> like if Bernie doesn't win, let's burn the country down. You know what I mean? She posted like six and, statuses about this today. It's super Tuesday yeah. when we're recording this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, People are talking about like, well, I'm standing on my principles, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know what? Like, like, okay. And like, if we're going to have this discussion, let's have this discussion. But I'm not going to accept the argument from you that I'm not standing on principle. You know, my, my principle is do the least harm, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's, I mean, you know, when we're talking more broadly about, you know, these kinds of conversations, I think there, I, I mean, I, I think there is kind of that idea. It's, it's kind of the age old, like compromises death kind of thing, right? Like mm. if, if you're willing to engage the other side in any way, shape or form, then you're compromising your principles, you know, as opposed to the idea that like, well, you know what, like maybe, maybe interacting with other people and getting to know them, understanding where they're coming from and opening that dialogue, maybe that's the principle that I'm standing on because I think that's important. Mm. Um, and, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's enough of that, you know? I mean, you, like you said, I mean, there's definitely a line to be drawn, right? Like if, if somebody looks me in the face and says, I'm going to vote against you being equal in society, I'm probably not going to have a friendly and cordial dialogue <laughs> with that person. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, basic human respect obviously is afforded to anyone. You know what I mean? But I'm going to look that person right in the uh, right back in the eye and say, "How can you call yourself a compassionate human being?" You know what I mean? You 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 very obviously just don't care. You know, yes. and I mean, and, and you know, you have to be real with those things. And I think, you know, they're so. Uh, th this kind of leads into another thing that that kind of comes up in, in a lot of, in a lot of conversations is the idea of like, you know, as soon as someone says that they're off put by something you say that like, Oh, you're the PC police, you're a coddled, spoiled child, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, to me, I don't understand why it's a bad thing. First of all, to take someone else's feelings into account when you're talking with them, even if you disagree with them, mm -hmm. you know, and you can draw a line and say like, look, okay, say, for example, we're going to disagree on the theory of evolution, right? And I'm going to tell you that if you're a creationist, you're wrong. The evidence is against you. There is no evidence for your point of view. And the people who push this stuff are like known liars and, uh, and, and they're pushing pseudoscience, right? Yeah. Those things are all 100% factual. And nowhere in there did I actually make a character judgment on the person who holds those beliefs, right? If that person then comes to me and says, well, that offends me and that hurts my feelings, at that point, I'm like, sorry, I don't care. I didn't make a judgment about your character. I just said this thing that you believe is wrong. Yeah. If I come at you that, and that's say... Hard. <laughs> well, that's hard, though, because we take our beliefs very personally well right and that's i mean that's something that i talk about in the talks that i give too is i mean especially when you're talking about religious beliefs you know because so many people's identities are so completely intertwined they can't separate you saying i think your god isn't real to i think you're an idiot you know what i mean yeah um but i i, I do think that it's reasonable and okay to draw those lines somewhere right I mean, we don't have to say like Sorry, someone's feelings got hurt. The conversation has to end, right? Like, it doesn't have to be like that. And I think that's often the way those those arguments and those conversations get painted. And, um, and, and frankly, aside from the, like, the most horrid depths of Tumblr, I don't think that ever really happens that much. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think it's just as wrong to say, like, well, I'm going to say what I have to say, and I don't give a shit how it makes you feel. I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about offending you. I don't care about being courteous and compassionate to you because these are the cold hard facts. You know what I mean? I think, I think those two point of views are equally wrong in how to approach these conversations, both if, you know, 
it, and I guess it depends on what your goal is, right? Like if your goal is to just make everyone aware of how you feel, then sure, I guess like that's cool. But if your goal is to one, like learn how to live with these people or two, maybe even change their mind a little bit, then I think, um, I, I don't think he originated the quote, but he was the first person I, I heard say it, uh, when, uh, Seth Andrews was having a conversation about this on the thinking atheist. And he was saying like, you know, a lot of times it's not, it's not enough to be right. You also have to be effective. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of middle ground to navigate there. And I think, you know, I mean, obviously it's, it's a logical fallacy to say that the truth has to be in between some two extreme points, you know? But I mean, I, I think in this particular situation, that's the case, right? Like, um, I, I think it's equally wrong to say that we have to, you know, 100% kowtow to any time we say anything that someone says, like, that hurts my feelings. Oh, sorry, conversation's over. But yeah. it's it's equally wrong to say, like, well, I don't give a shit about how you feel about it, you know? Absolutely. absolutely. And finding where you place yourself in that spectrum is difficult um, because there are other times where – you feel it necessary to um, put somebody's feelings uh, on the side, right? Like there are times I feel like j- totally justify um, hurting somebody's feelings. There are, there are situations in which there are other worries. There are other issues that outweigh the – immediate displeasure one person might feel. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm certainly not saying physical violence, but, uh, you know, emotionally bothering somebody can be outweighed by lots of other things. Um, but at the same time, my, my big problem here as this kind of uh, atheist in this gray area that's usually thought of as kind of... Um, I don't know, wishy-washy or too nice or too cordial towards religious persons is that what scares me, what scares me more are radical ideologues that care more about ideas and being right than they do about people. Oh God, thank you. And that, (laughs) that to me, that to me bothers me more because there's a certain fascism. There's a certain totalitarian mindset that ideas and correct justified beliefs are what matter most in life. It matters more to be right than to be good. And that is one of the biggest problems that I see in contemporary atheism. It's I feel like if you had to pick one, not that you need to pick being right or being good – but for sake, if you have to pick one, pick being good. Like, <laughs> well, right, and and I think you know, going back to you know what I said before. I mean, I also think the idea that you have to pick one or the other is false. I think you can absolutely, do both. absolutely. I, I I I think it's a false dichotomy. But sometimes you are in that situation where you you do actually have to make some sort of a decision. Do I really? Do I go full force? Do I apply the pressure, or do I ease off the gas a little? Brainstorm Podcast presents The Shift to Reason, Saskatchewan's first secular conference. It's happening on April 30th, 2016, and features some great speakers that include Seth Andrews, Nate Phelps, and Laveda Leaning, along with others. This one-day event in Regina includes lunch and a VIP after-party with the speakers. Tickets are available at shifttoreason.eventbrite.ca and start at $95 for early bird tickets with student pricing and limited VIP tickets. Keep up to date with the conference on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash shift to reason. Hey, everybody, this is X. And I'm Kyle. And I'm Felicia. We're the Utah Outcasts. Three out, unashamed, and active atheists living in Utah. And we are personally inviting you to let us love your ears each and every week. As we take the news, current events, and pop culture and give it a little twist... 
a love twist with consent. And we'll be joined each week by a special guest to tell us what makes them an outcast like us. Come find us. The Utah Outcasts. On PodHell.com, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And on UtahOutcast.com. We finally bought that domain off the kids handing out mixtapes in the mall. Come be an outcast with us. Take care of yourselves out there. Bonne nuit. And you're welcome. person I got into an argument with over vaccines, right? Yeah. And, you know, they posted an article, and this is not a moment that I'm proud of. Like, <laughs> that's one thing that I always, like, try and remind myself of is when I'm talking about these things, and I'm talking about all the things that I hate, that I am guilty of all of them. Um, so, like, this is not me standing on a pedestal pointing downwards yeah. at everyone. Um, but, you know, somebody posted something about... Um, it was, you know, the CDC confirms dangers of flu vaccines or something like that. Mm-hmm. And my opening comment was, this is dangerous, stupid bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, in fairness, it, probably it, was. it is, right? <laughs> yeah. But like, I very obviously shut down the opportunity for dialogue with the person who posted that. You know, before I've even had the chance to suss out whether a dialogue is possible, because obviously sometimes it's not right. Like some people are not even going to entertain the notion that what they think is wrong. Yes. Um, But I mean, I hadn't even given the chance to I haven't even hadn't even given that person the chance to say like, well, actually, here's why I think the way that I do, you know, because for all I know. That person may have lost a child to a vaccine related injury, right? Because we know those do happen. You know what I mean? So, you know, that that's an opportunity that I think could have used maybe a little more compassion than like, you know, just the direct like, well, this is stupid approach. Yeah, absolutely. There there is something to the notion though that like the other side of me is that there are dangerous, toxic, hazardous beliefs out there. 100%. And, um, and that, that cause real harm. That cause real world, real life harm to people. Absolutely. And of course, beliefs aren't disembodied, um, uh, abstract concepts floating out and about. They're implemented by people, by persons, right? With power, with motivations. And, um, but at the same time, you, you always hear this criticism. Well, beliefs aren't either bad or good. How they're applied is bad or good, which is, which is false, right? The belief, what, I don't care how you apply it, but the belief that Jews are, or black people are three-fifths of a human being is, is that belief in itself. I don't care what you, how you implement it. I mean, I do. But of its own, that belief is hazardous. Right. Right. I can't imagine somebody believing that and treating Jews or black people better because of it. Like there, it's it boggles the mind to even think that. So there are beliefs kind of in themselves that are hazardous. I don't care who holds them or not. The belief for LGBT persons, the conservative fundamentalist Christian belief that, right, you're indulging in your evil nature that your that aids is a punishment from god that um you deserve the hell and poverty and pain and all of this to me those beliefs are just hazardous right i can't imagine a way that you could hold those beliefs and treat those people better so i i i want to dispel the notion that like beliefs are ideologically neutral that they don't They don't have efficacy. They're kind of just sitting there and you can use them as you will. Well, yeah, (laughs) I I have a hard time imagining having relate racist beliefs that you use to treat other races better. Right. Um, Yeah. Well, so that's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and and that's like why one of the most annoying things that I see in, 
you know, atheist circles is the, the talking about ideas that's 100% dispassionate as if ideas exist in a vacuum. They very obviously don't, you know, yes. if, cause, cause the thing is that, you know, people talk about like, well, you, 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 you gotta have a dialogue. You gotta have the conversation. You gotta give the other side a, you know, the, the other side, uh, has just as much right to say what they have to say as you do. And I mean, when we're talking about the right to say what you want, I obviously agree with that. But I'm also not going to pretend like those things are morally equivalent to one another, you know, Absolutely. because because I, I'm not going to pretend that me talking about inclusion is morally equivalent to someone else talking about exclusion because it's not. Mm. Um, it's it's equally protected as a fundamental right. And if the government tried throwing people in jail for it, I would obviously be against that, you know. But I'm not going to hold someone's right to be hateful as sacrosanct as I hold mine to be loving and inclusive. I'm just not. And when, you know, when people have talks about, like, you know, people getting disinvited from conferences and disinvited from talks and stuff like that. And, and they're like, well, have the conversation, have the conversation, blah, blah, blah. And it's, I think, like, and, and it's, it's so funny because, you know, there was this big, there was this big dust up over Richard Dawkins being disinvited from the Nexus uh, convention, right? Yep. And, and and it was because he shared a video that was god awful. I mean, it was yep. terrible, right? And like, okay, like maybe to his credit, he realized what he did and took it down later, you know. But this is also the guy that, if memory serves, refuses to debate creationists because he doesn't want to legitimize their point of view, right? Yep. So. <laughs> That's ironic, isn't it? Is in in the same people who are supporting this guy are the people who were saying like, yes, I should give a radical anti-feminist a platform to have something to say because we're all about the free exchange of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And I just I just don't accept that. You know what I mean? I mean, I accept your right to say whatever, but yeah. I don't accept that I have a moral obligation to treat every viewpoint as equal because I don't, and I'm not going to. Absolutely. Absolutely. That would be a pretend pluralism. Like it, it's not, it's not, it's not the case that because you believe in the right for a person to express their views, that doesn't mean that they should be given any and all platform for it. It doesn't mean uh, free speech is not consequence free speech. Like there are consequences to the stuff that you say. And if we believe in this kind of idea of free speech. We also believe in the idea for people to um, make judgments based on what people have said. And so, yeah, I have, there, there's no, um, there's no inherent need to give somebody a platform just because they have some view. Now there, there I do agree with you that there is a, <laughs> There is a sense in which if you're going to ask me, you know, should creationism be taught alongside evolution in public schools, I'm going to scoff and say, of course not, right? They're not on the same level. Um, but like you said, there's a big difference between that and between saying, right, uh, that it should be outlawed for somebody to believe it or somebody right. to share it with their family or, I mean, there's a big difference between the two, Um but of course, this, these lines too, right? Like this free speech um, line is—it's complicated. It's difficult. Um, there is something to uh, being willing to hear people that we disagree with, right? Even Richard Dawkins or whoever the hell. Like there is a sense in which um, we need to be open to allowing and being all right with other people promoting this stuff. And, but at the same time, for God's sakes, it doesn't mean that everyone has to like him. It doesn't mean everyone has to agree with him. And it doesn't mean any conference should take him. Right. Like as far as I'm concerned, whenever I see him associated with the conference, I already have a negative view of the conference. Like, there should be social repercussions to saying bigoted and uh, misogynistic shit. Yeah, I agree. The, uh, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of something I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say one time. 
And Neil deGrasse Tyson, to me, is someone who is impressively apolitical (laughs) at the same time that he is unapologetically real about science. Um, it, it, It is amazing to me how well he walks this line. And I heard him say something once that really, really resonated with me. And I'm I'm obviously not going to quote it verbatim because I don't have it in front of me. But the gist of it was that reality doesn't have a political party, right? So we know, based on evidence, that climate change is happening and that it's largely man-made, Right. We, I mean, we just know that. That's a fact, right? That, that's an apolitical fact. Now, you can have a conservative view of how to deal with that reality and a liberal view of how to deal with that reality, but it begins with acknowledging reality, right? Yeah. And yeah, he says, you know, you can, you, can, uh, you can have your own opinions, but you can't have your own facts. Right. So you, th- that's kind of why... You know, the intro for the show has been the same, you know, since since the show began. And I say, you know, um, your source for news, discussion, commentary, and debate. When there, we I don't know, never really had a debate so much on the show. Do um, it. <laughs> well, we may, but the whole point is that like, I'm not going to invite someone on the show who disagrees with my fundamental right to inclusion in society, right? Uh, I'm not yeah. gonna. I'm not gonna invite someone on the show who says, "Well, being trans isn't a real thing. You have a mental disorder." You know what I mean? I'm not going to give. I'm not going to give a person who holds that point of view on my platform. I'm just not. Uh, one, I'm not going to expose my listeners to it, and two, I'm not going to validate that point of view by having that conversation. Now, if I want to have, you know, an activist on who disagrees with me about approaches towards activism. When, you know, we agree on the basic premises of like, okay, so the way LGBT people are treated in society is bad. Let's fix it. You know, that's agreeing on the basic reality. And then we can have plenty of different approaches to how to fix that problem. You yeah. know, um, and, and, you know, that is a debate and a discussion I'm 100% for having um, because there's lots of great ideas, lots of different approaches and that kind of stuff. And I'm all for that. But you have to acknowledge the basic reality first. And, um, and and I guess kind of bringing it back to the beginning is when you're talking about, you know, what people do and don't believe about the world, you know, again, it comes back to where you're going to draw that line, right? Like, there are some people that you're just not going to engage with, and there are some people that you are, and there's a large gray area in between. And, uh, you know, how you decide those things is, you know, really intensely personal and, and really important, so... I don't know. Ari, you have been super quiet for almost this entire episode. I am yeah, really. You guys have been talking back and forth. The yeah, whole I'm time. sorry. I've been feeling bad <laughs> about that. <laughs> well, you, I, I, and, and I know you're not like super like hardcore extrovert like I am, but just interrupt if you got something to say. Um, cause, uh, cause, cause I know when I do this and I ask you what you think, there's usually a really long rant with lots of good stuff in it. So I'm really curious to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> We've covered so many topics. I wouldn't even know where to start now. I don't know. Just so, uh, so I think you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> All y'all are terrible. Well, so, I mean, so so how do I mean how do you approach these kinds of discussions? Like, where do you draw the line as far as like people you're going to engage with and people you're not, and how you approach those talks? There are a whole bunch of different factors. Um, a lot of this is a work in progress for me, and a lot of this is stuff that I've learned recently. Um, getting into more discussions, especially online and through the show. Um, the first factor for me is my own mental and emotional state at the moment. I have to gauge whether or not I am in the correct headspace to be able to have a productive conversation. That is because so important. <laughs> as somebody, you know, with social anxiety, um, a lot of really intense kind of conversations, especially when it gets really personal, um, can put me into a really bad emotional place where, um, it's going to ruin my whole day or my whole week. And then at the same time, I'm not going to be um, very effective in talking to this person because I'm just going to get angry and upset. So number one is gauging, am I in the right, um, the right frame of mind to be able to have maybe a tough conversation? And if I'm not, then I have to kind of make the decision um, whether or not I'm going to bow out and maybe let someone else handle this situation. Um, number two in the same vein is, 
um, my gauging of that person, do I think that they are going to be receptive, which is something that we've talked about, um, you know, earlier in this conversation. Not everyone is, even if you're the politest, most, um, you know, clear headed, rational person, just laying out the facts and being very kind of mousy about it. There are plenty of people out there that aren't really interested in having a conversation at all. They know they're right. They know you're wrong and you're stupid and you're terrible and nothing that you say is going to convince them at all. So if that's the case, um, you know, it, it kind of depends also in that case because even if you're not going to convince that person, um, there's an, ar- there's a, an argument, especially, um, that I've heard a lot with, um, prominent atheist debaters like Matt Dillahunty. A lot of times he's not even debating the person to try and change their mind because he pretty much knows from the get-go that that's not going to happen. He is debating the person to expose how ridiculous their views are and in turn just kind of demonstrate that to the audience. Like this is, this kind of person can't be reasoned with. So why would you want to, you know, be on the side of somebody who's not going to listen to anything and they just know that they're right. So it kind of depends on whether my goal is to try and convince that person or at least get them to see my point of view or whether it's more for the people listening. Yeah, I think that's a I mean you you bring up like two really fantastic points there. You know, one being do I have the headspace and the emotional capacity to do this because that stuff can be exhausting like when because when we're arguing over LGBT equality, we're arguing over our lives. You know what I mean? Right. It, it goes back to the idea that these aren't abstract ideas. You know, I'm I'm literally talking to you about the quality of my life and how I am able to navigate society. You know, so it, it, it it's not just like, you know, debating, you know, heady philosophy stuff, you know? Um, and yeah, then, like this is personal stuff. Like you're basically telling me that I'm a terrible person and I deserve to die and all this, all this kind of thing. So it's not very easy to be objective when somebody is making things personal and abusive in that kind of way. And the audience too. I think that is so huge because um, – Another idea, I mean, speaking of like, I've brought up, you know, a couple ideas here that I would love to just get rid of is the idea that these conversations aren't effective. Um, you know, we can, you know, we, we can question why we would want to do it or any of that kind of stuff, but I think we can probably put completely to rest the notion that these conversations are futile in, uh, in, in a lot of conversation, in, in a lot of contexts. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I can, I mean, I, after, <laughs> After the uh, the episode that we put out last week, um, I mean, I got lots of feedback from people who were like, you know what, like, I'm ready to hold my nose and vote for Hillary now because I never <laughs> thought of it that way before. <laughs> and, um, you know, so like, I, I, would, I would love to just do away with the idea that these conversations and these dialogues aren't effective because they, they most certainly are. I mean, I mean, talk to... I mean, you, you hear them talk about it on the atheist experience all the time. Like, you know, people talk about how ineffective they are, but then it's like, well, look at my inbox and how many people have told us that, like, you know what? I started listening to the show as a Christian and all of a sudden I'm an atheist, you know, like those things do matter. And I, I think at the very least, like, I mean, I, I heard a, a really, really great story um, at a meeting that I went to and some of it was said in confidence. So I'm going to be a little cagey about the details, but Suffice it to say, there were um, there were some folks who were who were in positions of power at this meeting. They were state legislators, and they were talking about their interactions with people in the state legislature. And these were two gay people. One was a Republican, and one was a Democrat. Super interesting experience <laughs> talking <laughs> with these people. And one of the I, I was talking later with um with with the 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 republican state rep and he was saying he actually had a guy come up to him in the gym once and said you know what like i'm where i'm at on lgbt stuff because i know you and and he was saying like i've known this guy forever and we hadn't even talked about lgbt lgbt stuff in years but the difference was getting to know him and recognizing him as a human being with, you know, wants and loves and desires and, uh, you know, in, in a life of his own, you know. So uh, I, I think, you know, I mean, going back to what you said at the beginning, Kyle, about humanizing this whole thing at the very least 
And then there are so many people who are on the fence on these things, and those people watch those arguments and they watch those debates, and opinions can be formed there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, taking the audience into consideration, I think, is a huge one. So that's a good call out, Ari. Shanks. <laughs> <laughs> did you have Did you have any other thoughts? I was just thinking of um, a person who I think does a great job of this kind of thing is uh, Mark- Michael Marshall on the podcast Be Reasonable. I feel like I have a podcast for everything. Like every discussion, I'm like, oh, listen to this podcast. Listen to this podcast. Well, I mean, I there is a podcast podcasts. for everything. So but, I think that's fair. <laughs> so, so basically what he does is he has a person on who has like an extreme view. Like he's had someone on who believes that the earth is flat, um, like uh, vaccine deniers, AIDS deniers, UFO researchers, um, a breatharian was on one time. And basically, he just <laughs> Hang on. asked them take questions two about seconds. their belief. Hang on. Sorry, take, what was that, two, Kelly? take two seconds and tell me what a breatharian is, because I have oh. a feeling it's going to be awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, so these are people who um, believe that they can um, survive just basically on air and sunlight and they don't have to eat food that's as fantastic as i thought it was going to be go ahead yes. sorry <laughs> um shit what was i saying callie uh, um so yeah the, so he this has guy these people is, yeah, on yeah. and he pretty much he's not combative at all he doesn't ever raise his voice or um interrupt except maybe for clarification he just asks these people what they believe and when it gets to a point where he doesn't quite understand what they're saying um, he, you know, asks them to clarify further and he does push back, like, when they say something that's clearly factually incorrect, like, well, you know, this is the fact. How do you reconcile that with your belief? He never does any kind of personal attacks or anything like that. And basically, the point of the show is just to, you don't even have to be rude to people. You don't have to yell. You don't have to call names. They melt down on their own just based on the fact that their beliefs are completely not based in reality and that they haven't actually used their critical thinking skills. So all he does is just challenge them with pretty simple, for the most part, questions, challenging them to uh, provide evidence for their beliefs and to account for, um, you know, errors that they might have, especially logical errors that they might be displaying. And he doesn't have to do anything. Most of the time, they're just, they just like, it becomes completely apparent how ridiculous they are. So all he does is just provide a platform th- for them to say whatever they want, and it becomes pretty obvious that their their views have absolutely no basis in reality. That's awesome. I actually really I've I've got a lot of respect for that person who does that because that is yeah. not a thing I could do. Um, <laughs> um, th- th- you know that reminds me after the uh, after the the Bill Nye Kinham debate, there was a there was a post going around that had. You know, people write things like, if there's no God, how do you explain the sunset? Like, really. What about the monkeys? <laughs> yeah, like, really kind of ridiculous questions like that. Like, I mean, really kind of outlandishly ridiculous questions. And somebody wrote a blog post like, I'm going to answer these questions and I'm going to do it in a serious way that doesn't condescend to these people. And And I thought it was a fantastic article. I mean, it was like. You know, how do you explain the sunset? It's actually pretty cool how all this works. You know what I mean? And um, and, and that kind of inspired me. I did on a blog that I don't post on anymore that I guess I'll have to put a link in the show notes for because I mentioned it on the show. Um, I found this really ridiculous list of questions for atheists from some like Christian news magazine site. And I thought, like, you know what? I'm going to do the same thing. Like, I'm going to take those questions, those ridiculous questions that are they're, they're meant to be the aha, gotcha, atheist. Like, you know what? I'm just going to answer those questions without saying that they're stupid or without being condescending, and just say like, and, and it was lots of stuff like, you know, where do you get your morality from? What do you think of Richard Dawkins? Um, you know, where do you think life comes from? Where do you think you go when you die? Like that kind of stuff. And I got so much good response from that from my Christian friends who were like, wow, like, I kind of understand where you're coming from a little bit better now. So it's like, you know, a lot of those folks, I don't, and I don't think they're ever going to not be Christians. And I'm not even really like so much interested in turning them away from Christianity, you know, but like they understand me a little bit better now. And I mean, I think they probably understand the, the atheist position in general. 
a little better after that. And I and I think that you know that does come down to you know being able to 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 live with each other a little easier and uh, you know and to get along. So I um, hate getting along. Of course you do. <laughs> you're you're a, you're a misanthrope, is what you are. Yes, also a cynic. <laughs> yeah, that's I've good. been told. <laughs> I don't think you're a cynic. You I don't think... know me well enough, I guess. <laughs> that's a that's a cynical thing to say. <laughs> Wait, fantastic. <through> this. <laughs> well, um, Kyle, we are we are well over an hour here, and I don't want to I don't want to monopolize too much of your time. Well, um, can you tell us where we can go uh, on the interwebs to find out more about you, get in contact with you, find out more about interview uh, any atheist at church day? Sure, I would just uh, there's we got our Facebook page, you know, facebook.com slash interview an atheist at church day. There's uh, interview atheist uh, dot wordpress dot com. That's the website. You can just Google interview an atheist at church day or YouTube it because we got a bunch of videos up there. Um, I also blog. Them. I also blog for um, a site called Feminism and Religion uh, that you can check out. Um, so yeah, no, thank you so much for having me on, and I love your show and i'm um it has been really great talking to you guys thank you so much for coming and it's uh th- this has been a really good conversation i think it's um i love exploring gray areas because that's that's where the world exists um and before we jump off completely i would like to announce that there is a new pathos blog called removing the fig leaf which is really really awesome i'll put a link to it in the show notes and Basically, it's a blog about sex and sexuality post theism. Um, so, you know, sex and sexuality as, you know, atheists, as people who used to be religious and that kind of stuff. And I am actually going to be contributing to that blog regularly. So, um, super, awesome. super excited about that. Um, shout out to, uh, Sarah, to Sarah Moorhead, too. Yes, and Neil Carter. They're, they're, they're yeah. kind of the ones at the helm of uh, the whole Neil, thing. Neil was one of our first interviews for interviewing atheist at church day nice nice yeah he's he's a good guy he does the godless and dixie blog um but yeah i'm super excited about that blog there's actually there's already a lot of really really great content up on that blog and um my contributions will be forthcoming but i figured you know that's um you know we're a super sex positive uh thing here and and i've gotten some pretty good responses from the sex episode that we did so i figure we've got we've got a pretty uh a pretty horny uh listening audience so (laughs) (laughs) Well, that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Gaytheist Manifesto on Secular Media Network. I, again, want to thank my guest, Kyle Jones, for being on, uh, being so generous with his time. Definitely appreciate that. And I also want to thank my co-host, Ari. Uh, it, huh? Is, huh? That, is huh? that me? Yeah. Ari? That, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's me. I'm Ari. <laughs> you can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash the Gaytheist Manifesto. You can email us at thegaytheistmanifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at Gaytheist Cali. You can find the show on Twitter at The Gaytheist. And Ari, you are on Facebook. Yes. So you know how the internet is a series of tubes. So if you go in your bathroom, you're going to find a tube that's going to be on the fourth tile to the left. Um, you're going to jump in that tube and just burrow down for about 3.2 kilometers. And eventually you'll start seeing some chocolate wrappers. Um, you're, you'll know you're on the right track. So keep on going. You'll find a door that's got um, like a little unicorn poster on it. And then it's going to have like a trans flag and it's going to say no cis people allowed. That's where I'm at. It's called Ari Coleman's Facebook page. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. I love you. <laughs> I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> if you want to support us. This <laughs> Jeremiah from No Religion Required has challenged me to uh, who can come up with the most creative introduction. I am now challenging Jeremiah back to the most creative where you can find people on Facebook. The gauntlet, Throw down, Jeremiah. The Throw gauntlet down. has been thrown down. This is going to be cool. <laughs> if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash the Gaytheist Manifesto and make a per episode donation to help us out. And if that's not doable, you can always go, uh, head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review. That helps us get heard by more people. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting, you're scared, if you feel like no one cares and no one understands, you need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is the Gaytheist Manifesto. Mwah. <laughs> <laughs>